Right. Uh, th th thank you for you that have, uh, that have joined. Um, we're going to give it a minute or two just to let everybody file in. There's a lot of very enthusiastic and, and even very slightly early, which is appreciated. Um, So, all of you that that have, that have joined, um, you will be able to. Uh, uh, we can't see or hear you. So, if you do have any questions or comments, there is a uh, questions box on the right hand side of your screen. You should see a little drop down menu. So, please feel free to to add any questions in the chat. Um, uh, it's questions there, and we will. Uh, uh, my colleagues can try and answer them as we go through and there will be a Q&A session available at the end. Okay. Give everybody another, another minute. Right, probably seems pretty reasonable. Everyone can uh, come in and catch up as they as they turn up. All right, more coming in. Right, thank you to those who have just joined. Um, so we've got we've got three presenters today. We've got uh, Paul Adley, Martin Whitford, and myself, David Lindsay Hood, and we're going to be discussing uh, the journey to net zero uh, for UK businesses. So we've got uh, three presentations each that will last about approximately fifteen minutes apart. And then there's uh, sort of 15 minutes or so for questions for a Q&A session at the end. Uh, as was mentioned, if you do have any questions uh, throughout the presentation, please do put them in the box, um, the drop down box on the right hand side, um, and we will come to them as we can. Right, so uh, I'm going to hand over to Paul, who will start us off. Thank you, David, and uh, welcome everybody uh, to your lunch break uh, Net Zero webinar. Um, I'm just going to hide my camera because I will be looking slightly uh, profile off the screen. So, um, so yes, <clears throat> Beyond Green, we're a, a B Corp, we're a values-led organisation. We've started our Net Zero journey through um, our active travel and sustainable travel, and we were fortunate to win the Vibes Awards a few years ago. We also are very much into a just, just transition to ensure everybody is able to participate and contribute to that uh, UK businesses uh, net zero journey. And that's part of us being a disability confident employer. So we believe everybody has a role to play in this journey. So, so we're gonna cover sort of approaching to net zero, uh, what the stakeholders expect, um, what is it and why is it important? An example of a net zero journey that uh, one of our clients, actually Anderson Strathburn, have gone through uh, and looking at how we practically implement uh, net zero uh, through a carbon impact hierarchy. And I would like to share some business case studies of how this is happening in practice for some particular areas. So approaching net zero, it's really a change management process. It's the big picture we have to, um, to look at and follow a framework to give us some structure and keep us sane because it can feel quite overwhelming. It requires the collective skills and knowledge and intelligence and insight from everybody in an organization. So bring everyone together because we all have a role in this. We need to do some numbers and those numbers are important to make sure we, to ensure we transparently report that impact to our stakeholders. It gives us credibility and it ensures people can trust and understand where you are on that journey. There's nothing really to hide. Every business is in the same, same boat. You know, we're all trying to work through this uh, big challenge of going to net zero. It's important because stakeholders are expecting us to be the best I think we can be. It will impact different stakeholders. Shareholders and funders want you to future-proof your business, uh, particularly in reducing the risks and making sure you have a business in the decades to come. Obviously we know with customers and clients that is about us generating value and you can see that more and more now they're looking for something more than price. It's how do you reduce the carbon impact in their business and their, and their supply chain? We know from what we hear in the news and around the world that young people, all people of all different uh, demographics are being attracted to join companies that are taking 
there in sustainability and environmental impacts as well as uh, carbon emission reduction seriously. So it's an important way of attracting but also retaining your talented workforce. It also is important for our local and global communities. You know, we un understand through the news uh, throughout the this year and previous how it impacts future um, our, our local communities with flooding and heat waves. So we're future proofing the planet for our future generations. Mentioned about supply chain, if you can help reduce the emissions in your customers and working with your suppliers, you improve your reputation and increase your revenue potential. And it demonstrates leadership. And it doesn't matter what size business you are committing to those net zero targets is you can be leading on the world stage and again making your business attractive so i've got a poll question here um you know cop 27 is to focus on implementation what's the most significant barrier your business is facing or organizations facing with implementing net zero there's a few options there if you'd like to select we'll have a, a few less than a minute just to do that and be good Okay, maybe just a few more seconds. Has anybody had a chance to, to respond? It's just how you feel, you know, what you think at the moment on that. Okay. Um, thank you. Oh, a few more just coming in. Let me know, Diva, when we're, you'll know where the responses are. Um, let's try and close that poll now and see where we've got to. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, what we've got here is 40% uh, saying one of the barriers is the capacity to lead. Yes, I mean, leadership in this is really important. Uh, another big area is the financial costs that can maybe outweigh the benefits. So maybe there's some information required there and also just having the in-house knowledge and expertise. So that was one of the um, areas, you know, what we were not noticing that there wasn't really a response for strategic priorities, not as priority. So it does seem as a priority, but we've just got to work out how we can implement. So that is great. Thank you for sharing your views there. Um, right. So what is net zero? Well, let's look at why we're in this position just briefly. Carbon dioxide has increased by 50 percent uh, compared to pre-industrial levels and in particular that a third of that increase has happened in the last 20 years so this is why it's becoming a more and more of a pressing issue it's important because global temperatures have increased by over 1.2 degrees now compared to that uh, pre-industrial era and there's a complicated chart on the right which i will just cover a little briefly and in glasgow last year the cop 26 there was an an aim to keep our global warming to within one and a half degrees from that you know pre-industrial area and you can see on the chart that green line to the left is really the trajectory that we need to cut that's a rapid and sudden reduction in emissions to ensure by 2100 the end of this century we do achieve one and a half degrees to ensure our planet can sustain um, humanity and all the uh, life um, we rely on in COP27, live at the moment in Egypt, the big theme is we all need to start to act now. There's been discussion, we've got scientific evidence, there's a momentum building, now's the time to, to act. And this is what we can see is what's acting. So companies around the world are setting some of the most ambitious targets, and there's a lot of detail in this chart and you can see where the evidence has come from. But what you can see in the middle, the green dots are around companies committing to a 50% reduction in their carbon emissions um, at one and a half degrees and you can see this coalescing around these are the large multinational companies and those are driving the supply chain and through the SME sector and if we look at the SMEs in the UK and this has been reported recently as well I think just yesterday that we are a, SMEs are a significant part of the UK carbon emissions 50 percent because it's all of those SMEs that are supplying the larger companies and the economy um, with goods and services and products, their emissions account for half of the UK emissions. However, 34%, depending on the sector, are sort of carbon complacent, like I don't need to worry about it too much. However, the general themes out of this research and survey from the uh, British Business Bank is that the reasons were it's strategically important. It aligns to our purpose. It does make financial sense. Cutting emissions saves costs and saves energy. 
and compliance was less of a driver than perhaps with other environmental matters in the past. So there's a reason for large and medium-sized small companies to, to be on this journey. So I think let's just quickly look at what uh, net zero is really um, meaning. It means that we are trying to achieve a balance between the carbon emitted, those things on the left-hand side, such as you know, our travel and our industry, to what the earth can remove through its natural systems, such as forests and oceans. And the idea is that keeps that in balance. We know at the moment, from what I outlined earlier, we are not in balance. The Earth's atmospheric emissions are increasing rapidly and well above their, their natural balance. So we need to do some work to bring that back into balance. A point just to clarify on terms. We've heard probably carbon neutrality in the past. Um, and this is re reflecting this in a couple of scales. Carbon neutrality is we're more or less offsetting the emissions we generate with planting trees or some of those um, effects in, in the natural environment that can absorb that carbon. But we're not really changing the amount of emissions we generate indicated here by a couple of elephants. What net zero is telling us or, or challenging us to do is we need to reduce the size of the scales. And in Scotland, we have got a target of, of net zero. The Scottish government's target is net zero by 2045. And so you can see we need to reduce those um, absolute emissions that are uh, put into the atmosphere. So that is really uh, the fundamental difference. It's also important because it connects to the wider sustainable development goals of which there are 17 that covers aspects of our biosphere, the planet, which are net zero indicated in the bottom right hand uh, quadrant of the chart on the, on the bottom in terms of climate action. But it also supports areas of society, you know, uh, health and well-being, for example, food poverty, and that then in turn supports our economy through innovation and infrastructure, um, resource consumption and use, for example. It is important to see that climate action is not just it in itself and it can't diminish the other goals. We have to work collectively with these. And in fact, there's a win-win by doing this. If we can reduce emissions, we can be more efficient. We can have a, a growing, growing economic benefit um, while not um, impacting the planet. You may have heard about how do we set targets? Well, global science determines really that carbon reduction pathway to limit warming to one and a half degrees. And in a big picture, this is our last chance to cut emissions by 50% in the next eight years of remaining of this decade. Countries around the world have varying net zero long-term targets between 2045 and uh, 2070. So that's the challenge. In the immediate challenge is for businesses to cut their emissions by around 50% from a 2020 baseline. So what we try and do with net zero is trying to help businesses on those initial first steps. You know, let's have a look at what the key emission categories you have. Let's calculate in step two the baseline for net zero so you know what you're, you're aiming from. Get everybody involved, generate ideas across the company from all activities. Everybody will have a view on something that can be done better or smarter or reduce the amount of demand um, on energy, for example. So we get those ideas and then in step four, we need to prioritize those. We've only got so much resources and time and money available. So where do we need to put our best uh, bang for our buck in terms of carbon reduction? Um, so that's what we're aiming there. And this is our first step and then we'll report. You need to report that net zero strategy and you'll repeat this cycle um, year on year really to keep improving. I'd like to talk you through briefly with Anderson Strathern's net, net zero journey and I know Martin will cover a little bit more detail in his presentation at the end of uh, this webinar. But we did some whiteboard sessions to figure out net zero. We did the numbers, we had COVID, we came back and we built a roadmap for the reduction to 2030. They broadcasted that emission, made that public commitment, and then formed a net zero working group and started to build their reporting, internal reporting process. That continued in 2022, and that net zero strategy is now embraced at all levels across the firm. They've expanded the scopes this year, continue with progressing, working on new methodologies and using software solutions such as Ecometrica, continued the staff engagement. We had a session just last week and then looking now how we report the final results for 2022. So 
that's an example of, of how we went through a process with a company. Uh, now let's look at how we put this into practice and thinking of breaking down the carbon impact um, and how we take make action, take action. So this is a hierarchy to reduce demand, look at where you can save energy or, or whatever at the, at the start. Can you do things more efficiently? If you can't do anything more efficiently, can you supply your energy, in, in, for example, through renewable energies? If that is everything you can do, then offset is at that position. And what's important to, to know is that the higher we are up that hierarchy, the more cost, the higher the carbon in benefit, and also the greater the cost savings. The top three elements are really linked to the science-based targets. We cannot achieve net zero by just offsetting. That's how we tackle those residual emissions. But really, it's driving us to do real practical and um, reductions in absolute emissions. So I'd like to share a couple of case studies here of how this has happened in practice. Um, uh, this is a, a company uh, out in uh, the central belt of Scotland, a packaging manufacturer. Um, so work that we did for them was really looking at their factory. Very difficult factory um, area to heat. You'll probably be aware of these. Some of you may work in them. Kind of big shell with you know a lot of open space with all your machinery and warehouse, etc. So one of the big challenges was how to heat this. And so the work we did was to replace the factory heating with radiant heaters from big gas air blowers. This um, actually in Scotland, there is support through the Scottish government and they were able to attain a funding and a grant. Now, this reduced energy consumption. We've just had the latest data over 12 months and this was implemented. A huge reduction in energy, around 60%. The payback um, was two and a half years at the time of um, we implementing, but with the energy price increases, that energy saving has now resulted in, an, in, in a real saving now. Of, of three nearly well, nearly three times and reduce the payback um which is what you would have uh, within 2023 20, so that the exposure we're getting to energy prices by investing early in um, energy reduction and carbon reduction means that the cost savings have become greater and you know it's a significant reduction in their emissions i think around 25 percent so a really good story about something practical can help reduce demand and improve efficiency in that carbon hierarchy. Another example is around a food manufacturers, mid, medium sized company in Scotland. Uh, we've helped them look at opportunities around energy monitoring. It's really important to understand through your half hourly data how your energy is being used. They've installed LED lighting um, throughout the, um, the factory and also um, looked at improving and replacing their compressors in particularly leaks and getting more efficient or variable speed compressors. Practical things that have made a significant reduction on energy and are also looking at renewables. This has helped them build their reputation. They've won awards for the food and drink excellence and um, we're an environmental uh, management award as well. So it's built their reputation, future proof their business and protected profitability. So what we've seen here is um, that carbon hierarchy. We've reduced the, the demand, okay? And we've looked at improving efficiency, but now we're still gonna use some energy. We still have some carbon impact and it is more than just energy, but this is given an example within an energy framework. Um, how can we do that through renewable energy? And this is where I'd like to hand over to uh, David, who's gonna talk around um, the renewable energy areas. Thank you very much, Paul. So quickly, up my slides. Oops. Okay. So as as Paul says, we're uh, building on uh, so Locogen oops, are implementing um, are working to implement these uh, these solutions. Um, so we work with uh, organisations to. To, to take on take on the next step um, uh, from Paul, um, building on that strategy to work out how we can implement the uh, the renewable energy solutions. Um, we've done this for a number of different organisations, a lot to do with food and drink, and uh, uh, especially in the distilleries industries, but also a number of um, uh, services and 
uh, as well as local authorities and community groups and taking these organizations through the the, the full range of, of stages from that initial feasibility of what those renewable energy options are understanding how they have to do it consenting it and then supporting them through the installation phase to ensure that what they get is something that delivers on the needs and requirements they have um, because that, that plan only works if we can realize that, that sort of energy savings um, from the installation of those renewable technologies. And what we're seeing with a lot of these organizations is that these solutions are tied into the, um, not just into the generation of energy itself, but the conversion of their on-site processes and what the strategy is for that. So these are, these are things that come around in, in, in multiple stages, and it's a process of building on that en those energy uh, on the sort of energy hierarchy, and then reviewing it and understanding how those changes in their business model mean that different things will have to change, how we electrify things, and how that ties into the renewable energy generation that they need. So, the big thing that's happened in the last few years is that the renewable energy generation systems used to be funded at a government level um, based on the production of energy. So for every kilowatt hour of energy that you produce, be it electricity or heat, there were schemes that were available that would support you and pay you directly for that energy to incentivize organizations to go out and, and, and fit these systems. Um, you may have heard of the feed and tariff, renewable heat incentive, etc. Um, these schemes have gone. And it's important to kind of understand that because um, a lot of the conversations we have are around the sort of the structures and previously companies that invested and had these types of incentive schemes there that had been able to, uh, to give them a business model for taking renewable energy systems forward. Those schemes are gone and I don't think anybody is really expecting them, uh, them back. What we have now are a series of, of grants um, and, and loans that are available. Um, they are uh, they are some administered nationally, some 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 locally in Scotland, uh, and some even at the the, the sort of the, the local authority level. But they are targeted on specific interventions, and they can be time bound. So just because something's available now doesn't mean that it will necessarily be available uh, in in the future, which means that we have to be quite careful when we're making these propositions that that, that, that both we and the client understand that that uh, these decisions have, are not always going to be the same as things move forward. Um, it means that we have to be flexible about how we're considering taking these forward to make the best use of some of those, uh, some of those, some of those specific grants. Um, you will hear things like CFDs, but they tend to be for much, much larger projects. That's still a sort of uh, mechanism of fixing energy prices. And then there are new business models, such as energy as a service supply, um, which we're going to touch on a little later. So we've, we've split the energy uh, supply systems down into two key parts. There's our renewable electricity generation. The most ubiquitous of that is, is photovoltaics, um, used widely across the UK. Um, there is a difference in resource the further north you get, but it's not significant enough to, for, for it not, for PV still not to be a, not to be a, a viable opportunity. Um, it's, it's good investment, especially behind the meter photovoltaics where we're fitting them onto buildings and feeding it directly into the building to offset the electricity it would be buying in. And as Paul said, with the high energy prices, we're seeing incredibly good paybacks um, on those schemes. What you need is a decent roof and you need to understand where, whether your load profile fits with the generation for PPV. We've looked at a number of industries which have actually quite high electricity use. Dairies are an interesting um, example because if you're milking cows you've got a, you've got loads of, of energy but uh, energy demands but actually it's quite early in the morning and quite late in the evening and the pv generation is right in the middle of the day so although it might look to be a good op opportunity pv on its own without some sort of storage um actually doesn't offset as much as we uh, as you might hope so understanding what that generation is going to do relative to the consumption is really important and that's where we need to start understanding the data um, uh, from, from businesses about how that, where that energy goes and when. The other sort of big generation option is, is, is wind. Um, traditionally, we've seen quite a few smaller turbines, well, sort of behind, uh, less than one megawatt. Um, these are, tend to be the kind of size 
uh, that, that businesses would prefer, but actually one of the limits is the, the number of suppliers that are available, um, just in terms of, of that size of turbine, which is pushing people to putting in slightly larger turbines because there's slightly more, and more of them available, but that has a larger consideration in terms of, of planning, in terms of the, the restrictions, in terms of space and noise that you need. And that, that, that's really where wind needs to be carefully considered because it's not just the wind resource, but it's also the restraints, uh, the, the, the restrictions um, in your local environment, the local um, situations of your business as to whether that's going to be an opportunity. If you're rurally located, um, uh, your neighbors are a little bit further away then, and you've got a bit of land, then wind's an absolutely fantastic opportunity. Um, but sort of urban locations, dense packed, lots of people around you, it's going to be very, very challenging to have that wind generation on site. Hydroelectricity um, is, is a marvellous way, way of generating, but unfortunately most hydro schemes we look at are, are not close enough to the loads to be able to tie in directly, which means that they have to be, they're generally being done as standalone schemes. Um, and with the, the, the loss of the fit, it's actually quite hard to make the, the finances for that stack up. Um, that said, you know, exceptions every rule, I've got a couple of projects in England that are going ahead with community groups running behind the meter hydro schemes from run of river, which is feeding electricity in. So it can be done, but I'd say it's, uh, the opportunities are, are smaller than it would be for the wind, which is smaller again than you would see for photovoltaics. So, in terms of the considerations for, for, for PV, the sort of the primary thing that we're looking at, we've got to make sure that there's that significant usage, that, it, that we've assessed the demand and the generation. Um, and there are variations in business rates. We just need to be very clear about whether, whether the scheme uh, uh, needs to have business rates considered. Um, in terms of CapEx, currently looking at sort of 700 to 800 pounds a kilowatt peak, it's variable at the minute just because we're having supply chain issues. So so those costs are a little more fluid than they, than they would have been. But the downside is once it's installed, OPEX costs are incredibly low. The four to eight year payback there, I'm, I'm currently seeing ones that are, that are considerably shorter than that, half that um, on schemes with, with, with a decent roof and, and, a, and a currently high energy tariff. And the important thing is that if you can install PV now while you have a high energy tariff, you can halve that payback period again, because one year offsetting high electricity costs is worth for three years of what the what the tariffs currently were. So so again, um, uh, there's a big push at the minute to, to get schemes installed as quickly as possible while organizations are tied into those short-term high price electricity contracts. For wind, the resources, the, the limitations are all result based around resource and planning. Um, and to, to realistically understand whether wind is going to be an opportunity for you, you need a constraints and assessment as early as possible. To understand whether you know, noise, radar, cumulative impact issues with other wind turbines, whether they are going to allow there to be an opportunity for you to have a wind. Then we can do the same analysis. We're looking at the data to match against usage. Um, for, a, for a sort of a, a nominal one megawatt project, you're looking at about two million quid um, for that, excluding the, the, the grid costs, um, uh, which can be quite considerable depending on where you are. Um, that's roughly about sort of two thirds of that is probably for the turbine, about a third for the rest of the development works. Um, there's more operational costs for wind turbines. It's a rotating machine, you need somebody to come and keep an eye on it, so you need to consider the operational costs and if you need any rent rates, etc. But again, um, for a good location, although it's considerably more expensive than the PV, that generation yield is much higher. So again, we see savings in the sort of similar sort of moment for four years or so um, for behind the meter um, operations. Then we have our renewable heat schemes. Traditional ones for these were our, our, our biomass heat pumps and AD. I'm not really going to touch on AD because it's quite specific um, uh, to, a, to a small number of, uh, of, of organizations where you're producing some sort of uh, uh, some sort of biological feedstock to be fed into it. Um, biomass was used quite heavily in the time of RHI as a renewable heat source. It is still a, a, a viable option, um, but what organizations have found uh, over the last decade of, of running those biomass schemes is you need to be realistic about the, the level of operational uh, and, and, and maintenance that that scheme is going to run. It is a solid fuel system. 
So it requires constant fueling, maintenance, cleaning, um, repairs, which people aren't used to if they're coming from gas and oil systems. So, um, and with changes to the, uh, the air quality regulations, what's called the Medium Combustion Plan Directive, um, anything over meg a megawatt now needs to comply with those. Um, so it's become harder to get some of these biomass schemes in. Um, not impossible, but again, it needs to be considered quite carefully. What we are seeing a huge amount of is, is the use of heat pumps, um, be them both uh, uh, air source heat pumps or, or ground or even sort of a ambient loop, uh, shared network type schemes. Um, they have the advantage that they can have a combination of both heating and cooling, um, where you can combine that with on-site generation to produce the electricity that's running the heat pumps. Heat pumps are electrically driven heating systems, and that can be good. But for a heat pump to run really effectively, it needs lower operational temperatures. It means that those emitter systems, your radiators and your fan coil units, need to be sized appropriately so that you can run those temperatures lower, so that you can put as little electricity as possible into that scheme, which has impact. It ties well where we can do some of the operations, some of the uh, infrastructure upgrades, you know, improving the insulation, um, which which kind of module, which uh, 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 offsets some of that that sort of uh, that heating system upgrade. Um, but it needs to be considered carefully. It's not a direct like for like transition in the way that the, the biomass was because it is running at different operational temperatures. When we're looking at the finances for, for these things, um, the direct capital funding is, is the, the route that the most people are coming from, but organizations you know, rarely have that sort of that big, large amount of money sitting there waiting to, to go to invest in this scheme, especially as they get larger into the sort of millions of pounds. So, so the question is always, how are we going to fund um, these in, in, in interventions we've seen, you know, we understand there's opportunity for PV or wind or heat pumps, but who's going to pay for it? How is it going to get funded? So there are organizations that have that have spun up to fill those gaps to provide that that behind the meter installation support if that's what needs to uh, what needs to happen. Um, where they will come in, they will fund the the, the photovoltaics, the wind, the generation systems. And provide a PPA, PPA arrangement, a power purchase agreement, with a with some form of fixed tariff at a lower rate than you would be paying for the grid electricity. That can be I've seen anything between five and twenty five percent lower than the the electricity rates that you currently get. Um, you are going to be tight if you take up one of these arrangements. There will be some sort of contractual life to it, and you need to be aware of that because you need to be sure that 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 your that your energy demands, your usage is going to going to last out the period that we're talking about. So being aware of those any fixed fees, any lengths of periods would be good. Um, and, and be aware of the developer, do a bit of due diligence to make sure that the right kind of organization you want to be uh, in entering that long term partnership with. Alternatively, um, you can look at having those renewables off site. So you can uh, either you're certain you can go look at leasing land nearby. Um, to, to be able to install wind turbines, for example. Um, and we've done this, we've looked at this for a number of different organizations where their footprint doesn't allow for it, but they've, they've, they're, they're willing to kind of consider the more, uh, that, that larger scale um, operation investment. So, uh, so we've worked with them to, to arrange the, the land lease agreements, the, the way leaves that are the, the necessary, and the, the remuneration with the landowners so that they get that sort of benefit share, because that's what what tends to be what people are looking for. So I'll put in a few kind of understanding about some of the values and, and areas that um, organizations, uh, that those landowners will be looking for. On the heat side, um, there are a couple of different ways that people have, uh, have looked at doing this. There are ESCO schemes, which are basically like heat PPAs. Um, so, so they'll come in, they'll connect up some sort of energy system and they will They'll provide the heat to you on a, on a sort of kilowatt hour basis. A number of organizations have, have been looking at heat as a service where rather than paying per kilowatt hour, you're just paying a fixed rate um, for, for that heat provision. Um, and that's just a you know, sort of fixed price arrangement. Um, it works particularly well where those organizations can, can hedge against energy prices. Um, 
there are I, I've seen a number of development models for this, but there are a few that are actually commercially available. It's something that I expect to see um, a lot more of going forward. When it comes to biomass schemes, uh, especially if that was a route you want to go to, although the RHI is not available for any new installations, it is possible to buy pre-accredited RHI uh, boilers um, and have them installed. So something that might have 10 or 15 years worth of RHI still on it, have that installed. And, and there is a, uh, a now well-proven mechanism for, for taking that system and installing it at your, at your site and claiming the RHI. You need a specialist, somebody that can really deal with that transfer process. And in terms of the future opportunities, we see a lot of what the discussions we're having around three things, hydrogen, battery storage, and EV charging. These are not renewable energy systems in themselves, but tend to be tied in with, uh, with renewable generation because they're using the electricity generated to, uh, to supply these different systems. So hydrogen is an energy transfer system. Um, you're either you're using electricity to make hydrogen, if we're talking about green hydrogen, um, and then can be used to offset either as a uh, either heat fuel or transport fuel or even turning it back into electricity if you really like. It is still quite developmental. If I had a pound for every project I'd heard, I've been <laughs> I've seen people talk about compared to those being actually pushed forward, I'd be quite rich. Um, so we've got a number of projects that we're doing, but they are still working on grant funding mechanisms. So if you're an organization that's keen on hydrogen and you're keen on innovation, you're willing to, to invest in the risks, um, then, then there are some very interesting opportunities for looking at hydrogen at that development stage, uh, innovation stage projects. Um, but, but we need to be quite clear about what the, what the risks and availabilities are with that. Battery storage is something that enables the facilitation of that energy um, over different time periods, um, typically co-located. Um, it's every PV project we ever look at, somebody asks if they can have a battery. It's suitable to some, but less than you might imagine. So it needs a careful assessment um, about when it really works. And then EV charging is actually uh, of these quite interesting because it is a, an, in, an increase in energy demand. You're talking about increasing your energy because now you're talking about adding on the transportation fuel for, for people that are coming to your office to your energy demands. Um, so when we're doing load assessments, being aware of what that means is, is, is very important. So very quickly, a, a, a poll um, in terms of uh, just understanding from, from your individual perspectives, what you are considering in terms of um, net zero or on-site renewables projects over the next few months. Um, if you could take a, a few seconds just to, just to say whether this is whether you're currently looking at some form of net zero or on-site project um, in the next three months. Um, it would be very interesting to understand um, where you're at in these particular, particular journeys. So just give a few seconds, just to let a few more come in. Okay. That's, it's it's interesting actually because uh, I I'm afraid you can't see the, the results directly, but um, but actually the, looking at the results here, it's something that that the the vast majority of you on 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 the call um, are looking at uh, some uh, net zero or renewables project in the near future. Um, definitely, likely is is about currently about two thirds um, of you. So that that that's quite comforting. It's something to be talk about a little more in the, the Q&A session. So, right, if we, uh, if we close the poll, thank you all, um, and I'm going to hand over to Martin, who will now talk you through their particular journey. Okay, thanks, David. Um, Sorry, let me just show my screen. I think, can you see that? Yep, that's coming up. Great, okay. Um, th thanks all for the opportunity to, to speak to you today. Uh, today I'm going to speak about our transition to a net zero economy, touching on both Anderson's Strathern's own journey and Scotland's wider transition. 
Um, I'm going to run through some things fairly quickly, but very happy to pick up on specific questions or expand on anything in the questions afterwards. As, as uh, Paul alluded to, the concept of net zero is quite complex. It's sometimes misused, but there's very much a clear direction of travel now in the UK economy. And that transition is going to bring both risks and opportunities. And companies are under increasing uh, pressure from a variety of sources, some of which I've listed on the slide here. So to keep pace with this changing environment, we're recommending uh, to our clients and to others that they should consider whether they need to better understand the risks and opportunities and then take action to ensure that they place themselves in the best possible position for long-term sustainable development. The Bank of England has identified three uh, key areas of risk from climate challenge, uh, change. There's the physical risks, so that's the direct impacts from climate change, so that can include uh, insurance liabilities uh, include an impact on the, the value of physical assets from floods and storms. There's liability risk, which is the impact of possible uh, future litigation from those seeking compensation uh, from uh, others that they consider responsible for climate change, such as the oil and gas companies. And then there's transition risk, which is the one I think would apply to, to most of us, which is the result, the, the risk that could result from how we respond to climate change and the process more generally of adjustment towards a low carbon economy. So an effective net zero strategy that mitigates risk requires an assessment of the risks that your particular organization faces. So, you know, we're suggesting you need to understand your organization's risk, look at what controls you have in place to mitigate that risk and assess whether the residual risk aligns with your organization's own risk appetite in this area. Some other climate related risks that companies and organizations face include uh, changes to legislation. So future uh, changes to legislation may limit the ability of uh, the company to operate as they have done up to this point or affect their future growth strategies. Access to resources we're already seeing, so that's yeah, it may be more, uh, it may be harder or more expensive for companies to secure resources such as energy supply, market risk. Um, you know, there may be a reduced demand for some types of products. Businesses may be at a disadvantage if they fail to recognise uh, the uh, changes to, to to market trends. Supply chains and public sector procurement. Um, companies are putting increasing pressure on their suppliers to reduce their carbon footprints and public sector organizations are also subject to increasing green procurement obligations. If you fail to engage visibly with decarbonization, that could impact on your reputation and there's pressure from a variety of other sources such as consumers, investors, activists, employees and stakeholders. But, you know, it's, it's not all doom and gloom. Every business sector is now looking to maximize the opportunities from this transition. And we're seeing already a growing number of companies across Scotland who are using uh, the, the transition as an opportunity to do things better, uh, more efficiently, and with a, a reduced impact on the environment. So there will be new market opportunities, they're opening up, um, and I've listed here some of the other more direct benefits that businesses can see from the transition. Additionally, um, we think it may assist staff recruitment, retention, motivation, morale and job satisfaction. And we're already seeing that in some of our uh, trainee uh, applications that, that come through to us more directly. Um, for most of our clients, these drivers probably merge together to some extent. Um, some companies saw the opportunity and engaged in it long before net zero was, uh, was really on the agenda. And they're now seeking to, to build on um, their, those foundations. But I, th I think it's generally accepted that business leaders are increasingly aware of the need to make their businesses better able to deal with future shocks created by climate change. Directors of UK companies have duties under the Companies Act to exercise due care and diligence. Environmental concerns are now becoming financial concerns and directors of companies need to consider how they will mitigate their exposure to climate related financial risk. As I've, I've put on the slide there, the Companies Act introduced the concept of enlightened shareholder value, requiring directors to have regards to a number of factors, including the company's impact on the environment. 
And your company or organisation may want to consider developing an overarching net zero strategy that uh, looks at your vision, values, principles, and provides some guidance on how to uh, demonstrate and implement them at an operational uh, level. And over time, you know, we're expecting all companies will need to demonstrate that they've at least considered these risks and opportunities like cybersecurity or data privacy a few years ago. This is an emerging risk which we think should be included in the company's governance and, and strategy. Um, you will also need to think how suppliers are managed as part of any strategy, how we deal with suppliers and any other parties that we're in contract with is important here. And some of the things you want to look at is, I suppose, pre-contract due diligence, um, incorporating appropriate contractual clauses to ensure compliance and manage risk, and possibly looking at a supplier code of conduct that sets out the standards that you would expect and, and how that could be monitored. Training is also important here. Uh, you want to make sure that uh, all relevant staff know and understand and can implement any strategy that you do have. Um, and you'll want to look at who needs to be trained, what training is uh, needed, uh, when and where that will take place and how it will be evaluated and improved. And your organisation will need to regularly review that strategy and any accompanying policies and processes uh, to ensure that they, they remain up to date, so that they reflect um, any internal and external changes and that you are up to speed on uh, some of the, the, the risks that the organisation faces. You might also want to look at auditing that strategy. Um, you know, be better to regularly audit it um, than wait for a crisis to happen that highlights any gaps or failings. Um, and I suppose one of the questions you might want to look at is whether or not it should be an internal audit or should you uh, get assistance from a, a, an independent external auditor to assist you in, in terms of that. So how does this apply to us as a law firm? Um, Paul's already mentioned that we've put in place our own net zero strategy. Um, we've adopted targets to reduce our emissions and we're taking practical measures to reduce the overall environmental impact of our business. And Beyond Green has helped us with developing um, this roadmap. Um, our strategy is to be an entrepreneurial dynamic firm uh, which cares about its people, clients, environment and communities and net zero is a key component of this strategy. And you know, the, the, the ambition that we have here, we think demonstrates our leadership to current and prospective employees who really do desire real change in this area. So our own roadmap is about constantly improving our processes. In practice, we're trying to focus our efforts to achieve the greatest impact. Um, and that's going to involve a mixture of avoiding emissions, implementing more efficient working practices, and ultimately using renewable energy. Um, however, we do recognise that net zero will require us initially to offset carbon to compensate for some of our unavoidable uh, emissions. So what, what is our journey so far? Um, our total carbon emissions have remained steady at this baseline between 2014 and 2019, but the business has grown over this period. Uh, so if we adjust the emissions to reflect this growth, we have actually reduced emissions by about uh, 10%. And that reduction primarily reflects improvements in energy efficiency at our Edinburgh office. Um, nevertheless, you know, we, we recognise that net zero demands a step change for us to reduce emissions at a, a faster pace. So where are we heading now? Um, well, the, the pandemic demonstrates that we can work differently. Um, we have, like many other law firms, moved to, to a hybrid working model, which is likely to reduce energy consumption from our office space as well as reducing the need for business travel. Um, for energy we do use, where possible, this will be from renewable energy sources. We are moving next year to a highly sustainable new office, which will greatly assist here. And that building benefits already from a BRIAM excellent rating and uh, an EPCA rating. Um, but we do recognise that our carbon impact reaches beyond our direct energy consumption. And it's important we take action to reduce our indirect emissions relating to travel home working, uh, waste management and water consumption. So our ambition is that our absolute emissions are 40% below our 2019 emissions by 2030 as an interim target with a view to achieve net zero by 2045, although ideally we would like to go faster than, than that. 
Um, so, you know, we are we are still relatively near the start of our own net zero journey. Um, as we progress, we'll adapt to changes in technology, information, behaviours, and, and expectations from our clients and others. Um, and central to our approach is the carbon management hierarchy, uh, which which Paul already touched on uh, earlier on today. Uh, again, that's where the focus of our efforts and resources are at, at, at this time. Um, but we're committed to recording and monitoring our mission to ensure the key reporting principles of transparency uh, and comparability are adhered to. Um, and to this end, we're going to report on our net zero position, uh, net zero position annually to uh, a recognised standard. So, in concluding, um, some thoughts on how other organisations and, and, and companies may approach this. So, um, as I've said here, start now, um, but prioritise. Don't try and do everything at once. Um, be cautious in how you report on voluntary initiatives. Um, it's better to over deliver than to over commit. Um, make sure the directors or leaders of the business are briefed regularly and are comfortable with the topic before they have to take decisions. Um, as I said, the strategy should come from the top. Um, but keep climate change embedded right across the business um, rather than get trapped in a Sustainability silo. It's it's not enough just to to appoint a sustainability manager and think I think that's sufficient. So as I said, there board engagement, competence, and information all key to this, and and what, what we're telling some of our our clients that have an interest in this area. Um, again, I'm not going to go through this in detail um, because um, it'd be good to to open up to some questions. But what I have done here is set out um, a possible action plan and timeline for other businesses um, that have an interest here. Again, may not apply to all of you. Again, it's uh, and some of this is is, is aimed at, at larger businesses. But take, taking taking some of the headings here. Again, as I mentioned before, governance and governance steps, making sure that the leadership team is uh, briefed and up to speed on it. Understand your baseline, and that's where. Um, uh, the likes of, of Paul Beyond Green can help. Um, stakeholder mapping, so working out you know who, who are the crucial third parties involved here and how can they uh, be involved in the process. Um, then looking at risk assessment and scenario analysis, communications and reporting, monitoring and responding to changing requirements. And into the, the sort of medium term, uh, further risk assessment and scenario analysis. Again, uh, uh, the process starts to repeat itself through communications and reporting and monitoring and uh, responding to changing requirements. Um, thanks. I'll open it up now if, there, if there's any questions. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, now, we must have done a fantastic job because there's actually no questions there. Um, I shall take it the red, but between us, we, we, we've entirely satisfied everything that everybody came up with. Um, if you do have any questions, uh, there's a, both a questions and a chat section on the right hand side of the screen. Um, uh, I should highlight as well that the presentation was uh, has been recorded. So we're going to make that live um, on, uh, we'll make that available uh, I think in the next sort of 24, 48 hours. Uh, Jack Davia told me he was going to do with that. Um, uh, it will be on our YouTube channel by, by next week. Um, okay, so there's a question from Martin. For organizations dealing with public sector, do you see there being obligations they need to comply with? Uh, so, so certainly, I, I think there probably are in terms of um, uh, particular re reporting requirements. Obviously, the Companies Act wouldn't extend to um, most public sector bodies. Um, however, you know, a lot of public sector bodies now have arm's length companies that they've established for delivering certain parts of their um, uh, business and, and function. Um, so it would apply to those, and again, charity trustees, for example, may have comparable obligations. Um, so yeah, cert certainly, even if it's not a, a, you know, a statutory requirement, there's there's value in adopting a, a, a strategy here. 
Okay. I suppose I've got to just reflect on some of that point, uh, David, about um, not likely or the barriers that people had. I, I wondered um, if what what people is, it, is there a funding barrier that people struggle with. I wondered if um, there's any questions about how what could help them remove those barriers. If there's um, what, what people w would like to um, understand about any views on what was a question here. I think. Okay, shall I pick up the net zero accreditations question? I think something's just come through there. Uh, yeah, please. Think. So, yeah, they're voluntary uh, standards at the moment. I, I think I wouldn't rush into it, Mike, for the advice, especially for SMEs, is don't rush into that accreditation. Don't do it for the tick box. Get, like Martin said, I think we've all covered, really make sure that's embedded and it, it's driven for the business benefits, you know, the cost savings, the risk management, uh, future proofing, uh, the things we talked about before. Um, there are, there's a PAS 2060, which is a carbon neutrality. It's not quite net zero, but it's kind of some of those things. Um, there will be a new, apparently a new standard coming out. There is a science-based target initiative net zero standard, but that's generally for companies over 500 employees. That was released uh, October last year. Um, I think it's really, I think you can step back from the actual getting like an ISO accreditation for ISO 14001 and report under the GHG, the Greenhouse Gas uh, Corporate Accounting Protocol. That would be probably where, and explain that in your communication and in your reporting, how you've calculated those emissions in accordance with that uh, standard, rather than necessarily getting independent uh, third party um, accreditation. You may want it if you're a large company, maybe your stakeholders are requiring that independent evidence. Um, PAS 2030 for carbon neutrality does uh, allow different types of accreditation from self-certification, independent to externally verified. So that might be a standard to look at. They could be providing guidance for you of how you try and um, explain your, your um, net zero strategy in a, in a, within a framework that is a recognized framework uh, by those standards. Hopefully that's helped. And then there's a, uh, a, a question from Master. Uh, any help with finding funding to enable implementation? Where to find out where this is available? Um, I'm happy to talk about that. Uh, <laughs> it, is a, a, it is a sort of ongoing issue. Um, as, as I said before, there are there are some funding streams that are that are open um, regularly and, and consistently. So a lot of the Scottish government funding, for example, um, to support businesses where they're providing loans or even in small amounts of grants um, are, are available through the Scottish government. They, in their own inevitable style, um, keep updating what those things are called um, and changing the, the, the way that's implemented every so often. Um, for businesses, but there is a sort of a, a general level of uh, of kind of interventions. There are there are as you get larger or, or you get more innovative, the schemes become more more complicated. Um, so, for example, we are uh, they're about to relaunch the uh, SER, SIETF um, funding, which is the innovation so the Industrial Energy Transformation Fund, which is uh, focused around um, uh, industrial organizations, but you have to fall within a particular business category for, you, for that to be eligible. Um, and you have to, to, to pull together a bid for what you're going to do. When we're doing some of the hydrogen innovation funds, those are, and, and some of the other innovation projects that we've looked at, those are very specific and very time bound. So there will be a particular call. So uh, the Scottish government's call for, um, uh, uh, for energy transformation, sorry, the Energy Transformation Fund um, closed for applications about two weeks ago, um, which was one looking at predominantly hydrogen, for example. So, but that will have been a single call. They will now go through a process where they'll evaluate. We expect that there'll be another one of those that will come around in a little while or something similar. Um, but if you were to come around just after that funding call has happened, then you'll find it quite challenging to, 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 to make your project fit. So what I'd say is for the, for the, 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 the sort of more standard your your approach is 
um, the interventions are smaller but more regular and easy to access. As they become larger, more innovative, more complicated, the intervention rates go up, but you have to have that project ready to go. Um, so we work with a lot of organizations to try and support them in trying to um, understand where uh, those, that funding sits and how to access it. Um, so we're always happy to yep. have a conversation about that. I think if I can add to that, uh, David, if, if you are based in Scotland, then Business Energy Scotland provides support to SMEs up to £100,000 of uh, loan. Relate, like I talked about, you know, it could be from simple things like lighting or renewables. Uh, there's also grants attached to that loan now, especially for energy efficiency measures or air source heat pumps or, or heat pumps in general. Um, so I think go on look at Business Energy Scotland if you're not fortunate to live or you live elsewhere in, in the UK then from what I'm picking up is actually engaged with your local um, biz economic development team in, in your oh. council. There's lots of grants. Um, Martin actually just shared one with me the other day from Glasgow, wasn't it? I think there's a grant in city uh, Glasgow. I know that's Scotland as well, but there may be city focused grants in there. So I think um, engage with that uh, for, for things like small grant sort of funding, which can help a lot of SMEs then, then reach out to those um, local authorities. They will have um, uh, pots there. Uh, but if you're in Scotland, Business Energy Scotland, really good uh, program uh, with funding attached to to independent uh, advice as well for small scale kind of uh, energy efficiency work. Right, that's that's actually taken us right up to the uh, to, to two o'clock. Um, so thank you all for, for for your attendance. Thank you to the speakers, and uh, uh, we're happy to sort of uh, field any other questions or inquiries you may have um, going forward. So thank you very much for your time. Enjoy the rest of your day. What?